bed and you could have put on five blankets and snuggled underneath there and buried yourself like a ground log and stayed with your pillow. But praise the Lord, you didn't. Who can break these horrible blizzards that we have here? <laughs> this is a blizzard, so I can if it doesn't get any colder. So, anyway, we're glad. Jesus, warm your heart, right, and the fellowship of the saints, how privileged we are, amen? amen. We really are, so let's stand before the Lord, and uh, let's just begin to give him glory and be reminded of our great and wonderful Savior. the Lord and sky. I have heard my people cry. All who dwell in dark and sin, my hand will see. I who made the stars of night, I will make the darkness bright. Who will bear my light to them? Shall I send I am Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord. If you lead me, I will hold you people in my heart. I the Lord of snow and rain. I have borne my people's pain. I have wept for love of them. They turn away. I will bring their hearts of stone. Give them hearts for love alone. I will speak my word to them. Who shall I say? I am Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord. If you lead me, I will hold. the Lord of I will tend the poor and lame. I will send peace with them. I have been seen. Find his friend that I will provide. Till their hearts are sad is why I will give my life to them. Who will I send? I am Lord, is it high, Lord? I have heard you call me in the night. I will go, Lord, if you leave me, I will hold your people in my heart. I will hold. I will hold your people in my heart. Oh, 
the sun had ceased with shining Ooh, the war appeared as lost Peace has triumphed Amen It was finished with all How I love her voice My great opponent, fear once had a hold on me, but the son who died to save us rose that we would be free. Yeah, he rose that we would be free. Free from every plan of darkness, free to live and free to love. Yeah, is dead. And Christ is risen, which was finished upon that cross. Onward to eternal glory, to my Savior and my God. I rejoice in Jesus. It was finished upon that cross. Yes, it was finished upon the world. It was finished upon. Great is thy faithfulness, 
I will praise and honor no one but me, for you've accepted me. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. Okay, I got the wrong song again. All the saints, all the saints and angels bow before the throne, and all the elders cast their crowns before the Lamb of God and say, You are worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. But from you are all things. And to you are all things. You deserve the glory. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy. From you are all things, to you are all things, you deserve the glory. Day and night, night and day, let its answer rise. Day and night, night and day, let its answer rise.
ever see to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us see. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your Jesus, sweetest name we've ever known. All glory and all power be yours. Thank you so much for the wonderful love. It is a wonderful love like none other. We bow to you today. We bow our hands. Thank you. But no matter what happens, you have saved the soul of the believer. Thank you for the assurance. Thank you for the security in Jesus Christ. Thank you for the peace and thanks for the warmth of your love this morning in our worship. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. 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 You may be seated. Today, missions moment is from Nigeria, Africa. Uh, the name is Sage, which her family escaped attacked from fire. Sage, who has been nearly blind most of her life, her scream as attackers raided her village, so she ran with her three daughters in search of safety. Radicals, Muslim, Fulani men has attacked her village before. So Said knew their lives were in danger. She, her children, and several others took shelter in her brother's apartment. When militant found them and could break in, they set the building on fire. The apartment filled with smoke, but the group feared leaving to help her children breathe, Sage dampened her skirt and wrap it around their face. But soon the heat became unbearable, and they had to evacuate the building. Fortunately, the militants had left by then. Sage watched 
as the building burned to the ground and later learned that her husband had been fatally shot as he tried to flee. Sage and her children now live in a camp for internally displayed people. So this is the picture of Sage and her daughters. So if we can pray for her and her family as, and also our brother or sister in Christ in Nigeria. Dear Jesus, thank you, thank you so much for your birth as we just celebrate. And we thank you so much for this season uh, into the new year. Uh, we bow our heads and pray for our, uh, our brother and sister in Nigeria, especially Sage and her daughters as they are going through hardship and also in grief. Um, we pray that you will provide love and hope and peace for them. Um, we thank you so much for who you are, and you always in our refuge. Like you always there in our life, and I pray that you will help them to remember Sage and her family as they lost their fathers um, and the husbands at the head of the house and let them know that you are their head of the house and you are the father and you will be there for them and provide peace and comfort. We thank you so much for who you are and what you have done for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday. So our Calvary Corner, our title today, is The Most Important Sign. As a young boy, I remember seeing my dad's work badge for Libby Owens Ford on the counter with his keys. That badge identified him as an employee as he walked through the guard shack to punch in. He was obviously singled out from all others as an LOF employee, allowing him access to the company. Throughout the scriptures, there were identifiable badges that connected disciples to those they were following. In Genesis, Abraham was separated from his old life and separated unto God. The mark of that separation was the circumcision of the flesh. All males who followed Abraham were circumcised. This was the sign of a covenant between God and Abraham that promised him to receive a land, a seed, and a people who would, be able, who would be a blessing to all the earth. In Exodus, God imposed a new sign on those who would follow Moses. The observance of the Sabbath became an indication that people were disciples of Moses. This was a sign between God and Israel. Anybody ignoring this sign of separation would be cut off from the fellowship of Israel. Another sign appeared with John the Baptist, people of the circumcision, and the Sabbath now believed God was about to send the expected Messiah. They were ready to repent and be water baptized. The first sign was one of separation, the second sign was of redemption, and the third was for those expecting the soon arrival of Messiah. Then all signs were superseded when Jesus Christ commanded, you shall love one another as I have loved you. Thus, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You will never be recognized as a child of God without loving one another. Only the Holy Spirit can produce this kind of love. Without the evidence of loving the people of Christ's church, a person has zero proof that they are a Christian. They have deceived themselves. Love one another and don't be duped. All right, if you want to go ahead and open up the bulletin to the middle portion, we're going to go through some announcements that we have coming up. So just a quick reminder, the next concert of prayer is going to be January 14th. And then as always, that'll be 15 minutes uh, after service ends. Another reminder, we got Simply Through the Bible this Tuesday, 6 to 7.45. If you guys want to go and read ahead, it's going to be covering Ecclesiastes 1 through 4. 
Also, wanted to bring to your attention the Prophecy Conference that Calvary Chapel Dayspring is hosting. Uh, some of the speakers are going to include uh, Pastor Barry Stagner of Calvary Chapel Tustin, as well as Mike Galay, the Director of Operations of Behold Israel. Uh, this conference is going to be Saturday, April 13th from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, also, just want an, another reminder about praying the names of God, which began Monday, January the 1st. And also, uh, we have our young adults class, as always, 9 to 9.45 every Sunday before church. So if you know anybody college or career age that would like to join us, we'd love to have them. Thank you, guys. brand new book on Tuesday, and we'll be in the book of Ecclesiastes. So if you've ever read through that and wondered, what is that all about? Uh, you know, here we are, six o'clock on Tuesday morning, or Tuesday afternoons, evenings, whatever it is. It's dark outside, because when it's dark outside, then come on in. So anyway, yeah, come into the light on Tuesdays at 6 p.m., <laughs> and uh, uh, if you're not aware of it already, you know, it is an interactive Bible study. We do uh, have back and forth discussion and people do ask questions. Um, as far as the offering goes, um, let's stand. I'm going to just read from the Word, 2 Corinthians in chapters uh, 9, verse 6. And the Word of God does say, Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. I mean, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand that. You don't have to uh, have an IQ of 175. <laughs> it's, just, it's pretty simple stuff. We sow sparingly, we will then reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. And so, well, God can't lie. And uh, that's what he has to say about it. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly and not under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And that's the heart that we're supposed to have when we're giving. The God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance of every good deed. So God's got the whole thing under control. He's our provider. He's our protector. And uh, we have a wooden box at the back for anybody that may not know. And it's right there by Roger, the guy wearing the vest. And that's where we receive tithes and offerings, which of course go to the work of the Lord as it advances um, and it has. Father, in Jesus' mighty name, thank you for being in our worship, in our presence, for, for, for being in everything, everything about it, the mission moment, Lord, uh, just the reminder of how difficult many people have it around the world, and how tragic that that husband, the father, just taken out in such a cruel way. Um, and, and honestly, Lord, be the father, be the husband for that family that they're going to need to go forward. And uh, even the announcements, the Calvary Corner, everything, glory to you in all things, and glory to you in our giving. Be glorified. It's an act of worship. It's our sacrifice back to you, demonstrating our faith that we are not afraid. We aren't. There's nothing to be afraid of. And we give to you, Lord, that we can hear the reports and see the advancement of your kingdom in due time. So we pray these things in the mighty name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen? Amen. We're going to take that two-minute, 22-second break. If you know the drill, then you know how it goes. Make everybody, especially anybody that's new here. Well, hey, everybody. We're going to be in First John. We're closing in on the end. Um, so we'll have the big finale next week. But today we're going to be in First John chapter 5, and we'll be zeroing in on two verses, verse 16 and 17. And, uh, well, I don't even know what to say to introduce it. It's just a very difficult passage. John didn't give us a lot of details. But as you're turning there, the title of today's message is Addition by Subtraction. And that's what happens <laughs> a lot. And it, it is an addition quite often. So I want to start out to you, just by way of example, to... Um, Maybe it'll be a little nostalgic for some of you also, just to take a look at one of these overheads, if you could put that thing up there. And how many of you ever lived in the Midwest or traveled through the Midwest, and you have seen all these barns with chew mail pouch tobacco, right? Yeah, treat yourself to the best. It's everywhere. I even knew that there were uh, two guys that were commissioned to uh, follow a route all across the country and refurbish these old 
uh, barns. I don't even know if they sell male pops chew and tobacco anymore. I do know that there was a guy commissioned in Ohio, and all these barns from Sandusky all the way to Indiana were covered with chew mail pouch. One of them had Rutherford B. Hazel. But it, it's cool artwork, and, and it's fun to do big jobs like that. I ought to know because I'm a sign painter. But the thing I put this up on the wall for is this to show you that that sign has been refurbished not too long ago. But look at the condition of that barn. That thing's ready to go. You get a big enough wind, that thing's going down. Who cares how it looks painted, right? If you could put on another one there and we'll show you. This, thing, this thing's got to be ready to roll downhill. But you can see it's freshly painted again, but the barn's not in that great a shape. And could we put on the next one here? So, ugh, there's even worse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you could almost give that a countdown, right? 10, 9, 8. Okay. One more. We got one more. And this one is by my sister and brother-in-law's house. And so when people are traveling quite rapidly down Route 2, what they see is the sign on the barn, but nobody's looking at that roof. And it looks like a couple of torpedoes fell into that barn through that roof. And so you can paint that barn red, but at the same time, you could be painting termite-infested wood, right? And so I'm putting this up there just to show you that a couple of days after I left Ohio and I came back here, my sister called me up and said, the barn fell. <laughs> Because this one right here, it went down. So the reason I'm bringing that, if we could just leave that for a second, is noting the hole, noting the rotten wood that's just got a coat of paint on it. This becomes a picture of a lot of people in churches that will tell you that they're a Christian, but you really don't know everything that's going on on the inside. The thing is that hidden underneath is exposed to God. He sees everything about me. You know, he, just, he knows everything about you. And he knows what we need. Problem is when people want to continue in the things that they're doing. And our text is going to elaborate on people that pretty much not born again. Yet, they're singing the same songs. They're in the same meetings as you are. You think they're saved. They look like they're saved. But across the United States of America, there's plenty of people that may go to church for one reason or another, and they really don't have a walk with Christ. They've never really broke before them. There's never been a whole lot of humility expressed. They're kind of ashamed of Jesus or even mocking about him. So let's just go ahead and uh, can we stand and we're going to read our text. And so let's go ahead and read this. Can we do this? Um, we don't have it on an overhead, do we? So... In verse 16, John chapter 5, uh, 1 John 5, if anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life to those who are committing sin not leading to death. Okay, it's a sin or sins, plural. There's something going on and God is telling us that we're to pray. He, he shall ask. Okay, that indicates Here's what you need to do about it when you detect this activity, this attitude, this action happening. Now, the rest of it is a little different. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should make requests for this. So how do you determine that? All unrighteousness is sin. We got that down, right? The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not leading to death. Whew. Let's go ahead and take a knee, if we can, bending our knee, bowing our knee, kneeling before our God, just like we will before his throne. If you're not able to, please just remain seated. Father, we really need you for this. Um, we will not shy away from your word because we believe that the whole Bible makes a whole Christian. And so therefore, we need your insights. The Holy Spirit teaches, therefore bring to mind and teach us so that we can apply these things to our life as we continue to mature and become conformed to the image of your own son, Jesus, and it is in his name that we pray. Amen? All right.
First section in our Bible study is entitled The Initial Situation and the Supplication. And supplication is just a big Asian word which refers to requesting in prayer. You're going before God and you're making a request. You're asking for things. And so let's just read this portion, 16a. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask, that's your goal, to pray for this person is step one, and God will for him give life to those who commit sin not leading to death. We'll stop right there. You become aware that your brother or sister in Christ is doing something in a way uh, that is not godly, it's wrong, it's ruining their witness possibly, uh, it could be language, it could be harsh behavior of one kind or another, they could have a habit of slandering, they could have a, a habit of gossiping and uh, just you know cutting the legs out of some people and uh, to knock them down. And of course, the Lord wants us to grow beyond those old attitudes. They might have been part of behavior when we were lost and dead in our sins, but it's something that Christ wants to clean out of our life. So when we consider these kind of attitudes and these kind of actions, God has given us counsel when he said three words, he shall ask. And you could, you know, quietly to yourself say, I, I shall ask. I am the one who will then pray, and I will pray for my brother or my sister in this regard. And so this is how we would respond. And also, I want to make two points. You got to be so cautious with this because you don't want to walk around creating an image like you are the Holy Spirit or you're like that other person's Holy Spirit. Like you're just walking around correcting them of every step they take and every breath that they make. So we have to be careful about not coming on in such a way that we are self seen as self-righteous. And, uh, but then on the other side of the coin is you want to, because of love, address the situation in somebody that you care for because you don't want them to drift from the flock. It could be somebody just disappears and you give them a phone call. Hey, I haven't seen you gathering with the church and so what's up? What's going on? You know, you got another God or two there? What's going on? Because <laughs> you never know. People put something above Christ. It happens and, and they don't realize the danger. You're about to find out the danger. Okay, number one, asking God concerning what you have observed in your friend, your brother, your sister. Number two, you pray that God will bring a notable conviction to that person. And, you know, I just love praying Ephesians 1, 16 through 18, where it says, I do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, now you have heard me say this quite often, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him. And I pray that the eyes of your heart be enlightened, that's open the eyes of their heart, so that you will know what is the hope of God's calling, God's calling to them, what God has in store for that person. And when you're praying and you're asking God about convicting someone, you're not asking for anything bad. So there's the word convicting and there's the word condemnation. So there's convict, condemn. And they are two very different words. When God allows conviction in the heart of somebody, he's trying to draw that person closer to himself. He's, hey, come on, come on, close. This is a good thing. You, you feel that little sting. You say, man, I shouldn't be doing this. I need help. God, help me. But condemnation is when you're damning somebody to hell. And that's not our, we don't do that. And so our job in prayer then is saying, number two, con convict this person, my friend. And then number three, pray God brings correction and opens the eyes of their heart, just like we pray. So in first, uh, I'm sorry, in Ephesians chapter one, you see a great intercessory uh, prayer right there is a great outline. So what if you pray and this behavior just goes on and on and on? Well, in Galatians chapter verse 1. And you might want to even mark some of this stuff in your Bible. I always bring a Bible to services here. There's a Bible church. But it does say in Galatians chapter 6 verse 1, brethren, if anyone is caught in any trespasses, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. That's the whole idea. You want to confront to restore for this person to get back on the track. They're off the rails. And you want to get them back where God wants them to be in the direction that God has 
for them. And give them a spirit, restore such a one, but do it in a spirit of gentleness. So each one of you look into yourself so that you too will not be tempted. So you want to talk to people like you would want them to confront you. This is easy stuff. Just the way that you want somebody to talk to you if you were doing something that was going to be injurious to other people or to yourself. So when he says the word spiritual, you who are spiritual in Galatians, uh, the issue is anyone who is walking by the Holy Spirit. That's it. Anybody who's walking with God, you're getting the directions from God Almighty, and then you're that person, he who or she who is spiritual. And you do it differently <coughs> when you come before this person. So, Matthew chapter 18, in verse 15, the word of God says, If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. So, this is nothing where you blow a bunch of horns and you bring people and, hey, come on, we're going to gather together here and we're going to check all the private things out about my family. No. So, if your brother sins, you go show him his fault in private. And if he listens to you, you have won your brother. And that's a good thing. So he did, uh, <laughs> yeah, you don't want to go dousing him with ice water. Because why? Because after you talk to him, don't you going to want to pray with him? You're going to want to pray with that person then. You want to be on good terms with this person. And so, in terms of giving what? Because in verse 16, it does say, at the beginning where it says, he shall ask, if you start there, he shall ask, and God will for him give life to those who commit sin, not leading to death. He'll give life. This is not eternal life. Why? Because he said, if any brother. You can't be a brother in the body of Christ. You can't be a brother in the church unless you are born again already. So we're talking <coughs> about people that can get in a direction which can be detrimental to life, detrimental to health, and really not good. And so this is not referring to eternal life. This person is already saved. And the goal is to get them to experience the fullness of an abundant life. So when he says life in verse 16, life refers to that abundant life, the fullness of life that God would have in store or intends for you. And then, of course, doing all this without becoming the Holy Spirit and coming on in their face. Like really strong. So <clears throat> you notice the hole in that one barn that was freshly painted red. The whole thing was rotting away. And this is a picture of what happens to a lot of people. Um, it needs a full remodel, revamping. Before what? Before a total collapse. Because God is over here promoting and he's giving a counsel to promote what? That abundant life, the full life that we can. So we want to leave this area and entitle the situation and the supplication. We move on to the characteristics now of the unconverted. And I'm going to reread the bottom half. We can call it 16b through 17. There is a sin leading to death, and I do not say that he should make requests for this. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not leading to death. This kind of sinning and this kind of rebellion is not going to end well. There isn't going to be a recovery. There isn't going to be any restoration. We're talking about somebody with a habitual mindset that has no intentions of turning in repentance, changing their mind to walk with Jesus Christ, to surrender anything to Jesus Christ. Don't forget something here that's very important. I don't want you to get lost in this. In the very beginning, I reminded you that there are people in churches across our country who are sitting in those congregations, and this is picturing who they are. But they're in churches, so it's hard to detect quite often some of these people. This letter in 1 John was written to the body of Jesus Christ. So it goes to a pastor, it goes to a congregation of Christian people, but in that Association is danger. There's an appropriate attitude or an inappropriate action that could be performed, harbored by certain people within a church. I'm not saying this one. I'm not accusing anybody. Let's not go that way. 
But I'm telling you, with the thousands of people that go to churches in our country, you know what's going on. And um, this person that we're talking about here, this person that we're going to define and describe, is not in the inner circle. They may be in the building, but they're not in the inner circle of the family of God. They've never been adopted by Jesus Christ into that family of God. They sing the same songs, they're in the same services, they may bring a Bible, uh, you may see them with one, they may or may not be converted, and, but the thing is they're among the flock, but man, something is flat missing. And sometimes you just can't put your finger on it when some of these personalities, that, man, you just know something is off, something's not right, and then eventually they will leave. They depart. They cannot handle the blood of the cross. They cannot handle conviction, which is so good for me, for you, for everybody. That's how we grow. It's not in their DNA somehow, some way. In Matthew chapter 12, we see in verse 30, he is, who is not with me is against me. So Jesus doesn't see any grades in some of these. You know, it's, it's this or that. You're for me or you're against me. I like to tell people, if you're on the fence, Lucifer owns the fence. Get off. <laughs> it's a bad place to be. You get on God's side or you just walk with the world and you make up your mind. Because God will always honor our choices and he will not force his will on you. He has desires, but your will belongs to you and it's free. This text says, he who is not with me is against me and he who does not gather with me scatters so we're either a person who is gathering people into the kingdom of god or we are scattering people out therefore i say to you any sin and blasphemy which is uh, blasphemy would be like completely disgraceful comments and accusations against somebody any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven of people that's a mouthful you can say a lot of bad stuff, but if you repent, God will forgive you. You can do a lot of ignorant, stupid things, and God will forgive you. And Pastor and I have talked about King Manasseh, like the worst of the worst when you read the Old Testament, you see the history. This king, he had Isaiah song in half. He brought in more idolatry, the Ashtoreths, the Baals, and on and on and on. And then in the end, he repents. You're going to meet this guy. You end up in heaven, you're going to see King Manasseh. And he died in faith. So that will be forgiven. The blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven. The Spirit of the living God communicates to a person. The need for Jesus Christ. The, in John 6, 44, the Father draws that person. You get the attention. You look at, You start thinking about God. And you think, you know what? I'm not right with God. Okay? But it's the Holy Spirit that comes alongside until you receive the message, which is you need Jesus Christ. Invite Christ into your life. Surrender to him. He's your only hope of eternal life. He's your only hope of God. He's the only way. Yeah, I know the rest of the world doesn't like that. Tough toenails. He is the one and the only one way, Jesus Christ. If you're going to heaven, you're going because you're walking with him and according to his precepts. Amen. So we can't come against the Holy Spirit and his message and then expect to be forgiven because that means you have ignored the gospel. Christ is not your Savior. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man shall be forgiven him, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or the age to come. That's it. Not hard to understand. There are people that just keep running that stop sign. The Holy Spirit comes alongside them to persuade them, to lure them, to communicate. Uh, the Father has drawn their attention to, to identify Jesus Christ as the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the sacrificial lamb, the innocent sacrifice, for that all who call on him will be saved. And then this person turns away, says, nah, it's a stop sign, I'm just going to keep right on running. 
In Proverbs chapter 29, verse 1, we just looked at this. In our last study through Proverbs, a man who hardens his neck after much reproof will suddenly be broken beyond remedy. Beyond remedy. Boy, if you turn to that in your Bible, you will highlight beyond remedy. He who hardens the King James, I like the way they say it. He who hardeneth his neck after much reproof will be destroyed, and that without remedy. You don't play around with the gospel. You don't. And if you're if you're feeling uncomfortable, if there's anybody feeling uncomfortable, you're on YouTube, you're watching this, you're feeling uncomfortable, well, that's a good thing. Because if you are feeling uncomfortable about it, and you think, maybe I ought to do something about this, maybe I ought to surrender with it, maybe I ought to take my pride and throw it in the trash and never dig it out again. Maybe I ought to just walk in a humble fashion. I'll be good. And because you would be bothered by the things that I'm saying right now, that would indicate that you have not committed the unforgivable sin. You've not blasphemed anything enough yet. So come to Christ. Two words that begin with D. One of them is DC. There are people in this category that, you know, that out of real life ignorance, they just don't know any better. Uh, they think they're saved. They think they understand what's going on. But they've never studied to show themselves approved. They, they really are on the outs, but they think they, they're in the inner circle. They're not. And so they're deceived. They think they got, they're all in, and they think that the gospel is for people like what? Crackheads, heroin addicts, drug addicts, people from prison. And they all need Jesus. You know? because, but because I'm no great guy. That's my opening line in my testimony that I shared with the young adults class last week. I was never arrested. I was never locked up. I was never an addict. I was never a drunk. I never did anything that you would call really, really wrong, and I was going to hell. That's it. All it takes is one sin. We had, when I was in the Christian comedy group, the special delivery, we had a skit called Airplane. And some of you have seen it on the CD. It's put on CD uh -huh. now. We had an album, and it had 13 or 12 skits, I think. All the noises, if there was a car, you heard the car, you heard the car stop, you heard the engine. Then you heard the door open, footsteps coming to the door. It was really a great cassette, or a CD now. But um, in an airplane, there were four characters sitting in an airplane, two here, and then there was an aisle, and two here. We had lights, we had stage props, everything. And then we had uh, a lady, Jimmy Young, was playing the stewardess, and um, all these people were exposing their sinful behaviors as the plane was flying you know, to Vegas. And but then the engine sputtered, and you began to hear that sound on our background tapes, of, and the plane's going down, and everybody leans to the left together, and everybody leans to the right, and people start laughing, kids are going crazy. They're all leaning with us. And then they all start repenting, and it's all fake repentance. None of it's real. It's real as long as the plane is crashing, right? But Marty was this party animal type of a guy. He's on his way to Vegas, and he drinks too much. And I remember that his line went something like, Oh, God, I don't want to die. I just can't. I can't die. And I'm not old enough to die. And Lord, if you just save me and spin off this plane, I promise I'll never take a drink as long as I live. I'm too cool to die. <laughs> the whole thing was coming across. It's pretty good. Uh, but then when the plane leveled out, and he ordered a drink, and everybody else went back to what they were doing. And it showed that the boss hypocrisy of so many people that we're talking about right here in verse 16 and 17. This is like call out to God. But nobody's been born again. Defiant. Now they hear the gospel and treat it like foolishness. So there's on one hand the deceived and the other ones are defiant. They belittle believers. In Hebrews chapter 10 in verse 26 the word tells us if we go on sinning after receiving the knowledge of the truth there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but the terrifying expectation of the judgment and the, and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. 
Any who has set aside the law of Moses dies under mercy, dies without mercy. I'm sorry. Let me start that sentence. I don't want to mess this up. Any who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severer punishment do you think he will receive who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the spirit of grace? Black Canyon City is loaded with these people. It's infested. They think they're going to heaven. But they don't think it's so. Their pictures and stories, their indications are on that question. I have no clue who they are. I can tell you people who go to Lutheran Church, I can tell you people who go to the Church, but I don't know who all these people are just walking out. Because they weren't in any congregation. I did list on your sheet there, at the bottom of your note sheet, you'll see an area called homework. So I'm giving you homework today, and I want you to study, because we don't have time to go through all of this in detail today. But just read Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 18, and go through until uh, you get to verse 32. And you'll see this culture in the United States of America in which we live. You'll see it. You, you, you won't be able to deny it. It's loaded with reprobate minds. It's loaded with defiant people. It's filled with people that don't know which restroom to go to anymore. It's loaded with people who have been given over by God to the cravings of their flesh, and they don't want to do anything about it because they like it. They succumb to the pressure of the majority. If a lot of people are committing some sin, it begins to look like it's okay. Because everybody else is doing it. I, you know, for me, I remember what my mother used to tell me. Is just, you never forget it because you end up hearing some of this stuff sometimes over and over and over. So I had this buddy in grade school. And when we were little boys, he was Kenny. And then when I would come up with a rationale as a young boy that I could just go out and do something that my parents didn't want me to do, my mother would get in my face and she'd say, if Kenny jumps off the high level bridge into the Maumee River, are you gonna? Mm -hmm. Huh? You know? <laughs> How many of you have a mother like that? <laughs> yeah, she would say, you don't want to mess with my mom, 90 pounds of marine. Look at that. <laughs> You know what his mother said about you and Ted? That you and Ted would never do anything that bad. Don't you ever think I believe what she said? Because you and him are capable of anything. So, get me out of trouble. <laughs> You'll see that word reprobate or debase. And the, the meaning of that word uh, is really, you no longer think rationally, right? And God did it. God, get this, God did it. He pulled the wires out of your brain. You don't get it anymore. He pulled the plug. You're not gonna function. You are reprobate. You're not coming back. And then you might say, well, Pastor Huck, at what level, at what line is that evident that somebody has a reprobate mind? John said some pretty hard things here. I do not say that he should make requests for this. I'm just telling you, for me, I've never, I have never stopped praying for anybody. But what I am getting out of these two verses is there are people where the wires have been ripped out of their brain and they're not, they're not coming back. They're gone, they're gone, they're gone. They're gone. They have blasphemed the Holy Spirit. They are now apostate. Move on to the third section, picturing the painful possibilities. This is where, I don't want to go there. I'm going to retract. I'm going to stop that in the middle of my sentence. In Matthew chapter 7, uh, I didn't think that's I So, picturing the painful possibilities. Do not give what is holy to gods, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you into pieces. I would just say that the Holy Spirit has to one-on-one -on -one with you identify who that is. I know some really great people. I've had great mentors in my life. 
I wish I had eight pictures of, and then they happen to be all men. Sorry, ladies, but my mentor, I'm a guy. It's like, I mean, I'm still a guy. Anyways, <laughs> yes, I have the pictures of eight men from grade school on up that have been mentors in my life. There's only one left. And, uh, I love Pastor John Higgins. But boy, oh boy, I know some people that have come from another place. They're pretty nasty. But I've never stopped praying for any of them. So it has to be the Holy Spirit that would... God doesn't want you hating. God doesn't want you holding back forgiveness. And God doesn't want you killing yourself with bitterness, okay? He doesn't want you doing that. All right, so... And turn to everything. So we have one more, or is that it? There's one more, right? There it is. There it is. Beware of the dogs. <laughs> These are not, this is not Lincoln Finn, it's not Rossi, it's not, you know, whatever dog it is. <laughs> so these are nasty people. Beware of these dogs. Nasty people. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. Um, there's, that would be like the cults. We have plenty of cults in the United States. I got that book at home in my library, The Kingdom of the Cults, by Dr. Walter Martin. And he has got them all laid out and all of the tricks that they play on people to get them into these organizations. But we are the true circumcision who worship in the spirit of God, in glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh. No, it's all in Jesus Christ. So by way of example, what would some of this look like? If we went into the Bible and searched around from Genesis to Revelation, what would we find? Well, number one, we would find Pharaoh. He hardened his heart. God hardened his heart, he hardened his heart, God hardened it further, he hardened his heart, God baked his brains. You know, it just went on and on and on. Because Pharaoh was hanging on to that which he desired, and he was never willing to let it go, and God knows it. And so he just took this guy and said, great, I'm going to destroy you, your nation, and I'm going to knock off all your gods while you're at it, including that big river and everything else they have. And that was all going on at the same time. But Pharaoh, following Satan, actually played into God's hand through the whole thing. He had zero conviction in his heart. If we continue through the Old Testament, you will see things which, I don't know what we can all say about it, but Nadab and Abihu were priests with their father Aaron. They put strange fire on the altar, and God smoked them. And there was no discussion. It did. took them out. It was strange fire, Leviticus chapter 10, 1 through 7. And yeah, it was sorrowful, it was difficult to deal with, and uh, then you see Phineas, and they took their place. So Moses, God pretty much told Moses, you're not going on the promised land. Three times Moses asked God to allow him to cross the Jordan River and go with the people of Israel and go, I want to go, I really want to go, God, please forgive me. And God said, you go on that mountain and die. You're not going in. Of course, he did get in on the Mount of Transfiguration. We saw Moses and Elijah appearing, right? And Jesus and his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. So you could say Moses finally got in. <laughs> you know, discipline is part of the whole deal. He didn't just spake him. He told him to go out to the branch house and die, okay? And he did. Okay, I'm going to say, I have to say God bless you. Achan. It's hard to not say he was Achan. So, <laughs> but Achan stole the things that were under the ban. And God told him, will you people go across the river? You're going to do battle with Jericho. You're going to defeat these heathens, and here's how it's going to happen. It was all weird. You're going to blow these horns and march around, and the walls are going to fall. Okay, right. But don't take anything. You can't take anything. And this guy did. And he, he took like an idol from Babylon. He took this really fancy blanket and some gold. And so he buried it under the floor of his tent. <coughs> and then Israel suffered loss in battle, and God showed Joshua then that look, here's what's going on. And then they found out who, and he finally confessed to his sin. Now why couldn't he just take those things from the enemy? I'll tell you what, God wants the first fruits. Whatever 
if Christians are used to the whole offering thing, you know, we should have it. We have a box at the back. I try to back off this past the plate thing. So just, it's really willful. It's between you and God. But God is supposed to get the first fruits. There's no question. When I tally up what came in to me, it all belongs to God. And in that part where he guides me goes. I never, I tell you, once I, once I started my business, God boxed me in a corner. He was really smart. <laughs> He, he taught me how to, how to tie. There's never a question. And, and if it's something else, then he just tells me and I just do that. But I, I can honestly say that you might say, oh, Pastor Huff, you've got so many problems and so on. Well, well, I don't have a problem giving. I never have, and I can't think of. So praise the Lord for that. Use up. Use us steady the ark when it was starting to fall. And as soon as his hand touched the ark, God killed him. And then see, you think, well, what's so bad about it? He's trying to help the Ark of the Covenant from falling. And so the ox, you know, hit a bump in the dirt road, and he's over there trying to hold it so it doesn't tip over. And, and God just smites him right in the ass. And, and see, the issue is no, I think do not realize the holiness of God. You don't have to be perfect to get into heaven. How are you going to do that? You can only do that by receiving in a humble way, in a repentant way, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You're a sinner. You're not as cool as you think you are. Nobody's cool enough that you don't have to kneel or you don't have to bow. It's going to happen. If it doesn't happen here, it's going to happen in heaven. So why not get used to it? Then, here we have, oh, this one I really, okay, have to be careful. Jeroboam was the king of the northern kingdom. And him and his brother Rehoboam, Rehoboam was the king of the south, had great conflict, all right? And so there was a division, and this is how the kingdom of Israel split. You had Israel in the north, and you had Judah in the south. Well, the thing was, the temple was in the south. And Jews had to be three times a year at the temple. And Jeroboam was like, well, I don't, want, I don't want us going down there. So they just put a golden calf over here in Bethel, and put another one up in Dan. And he led the northern kingdom into the idolatry. So they had this child. And at the time of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, there is a child. It's not a baby, it's not an infant, it's a child. And so this child is really sick. So the king, Jeroboam, tells his wife, go down to Ahijah, who is a prophet, and Ahijah is blind. So she hauls it down there, and God shows blind Ahijah that the wife of Jeroboam, she's never named, is going to be coming through your door. So as soon as he hears that the wife of Jeroboam is coming through the doors, he says, well, come on in, wife of Jeroboam. Take your shoes off, sit still. Where did the Bible go? But anyway, she came there to find out about that, the child. So this kid is probably walking right now. Right? He's really sick. And Heidi says, you know, you and your husband, basically are some really corrupt people and this and that, and he starts rattling off all of the sins and the idolatry that you are bringing into this nation. Your example stinks and you people smell. You got it? So here's the deal. When you set foot in your house, that, that child is going to die. And the Lord is going to take that child. She walked in her house and that child died. Let's call time out. Let's back up a little bit. Don't you dare if you have experienced anything where a child died before you, think that that, that applies to you. It does not. You are not named Jeroboam. We do not have a Jeroboam in this church, and we do not have anyone named wife of Jeroboam in this church. Okay? This was a selected issue. You know why God did it? He said so right there. It's in First Corinthians or First Kings 14. Ahijah told this woman. God looked at your child and saw something good in him. So God did him a favor and took him. Otherwise, he would have been brought up by Jeroboam and Jeroboam's wife. And they were pagan idolatry. And it's this kid could have never had eternal life growing up in that house for everything that he would have been exposed in. And for the love of that child, God took him. So I expect to see that kid. I don't know what God's going to do. Some of these kings in Israel, but you know, 
Maybe yeah, maybe no, maybe rain, maybe snow. I don't know. But I do know this. I, I know not by experience, but by observation only, which is not as strong as experience, what that is when a child dies. I had a very good friend, very good. He was 10 years older than me. But I really respected this man. And him and his wife came here for a long time, and they were very supportive of me. And you know, there's a little bit of an age difference. We used to go to basketball games together. We just had no problem talking about Jesus and one of guys. I would go over to their house. She would make breakfast. I would buy him books on prophecy. This man had cancer. He was passing away. But he, he ate those books. He just learned everything he could about end times prophecy, right? It, he was, these were really what you would say. And what could you say bad about him? Nothing. Not from what I know. And they had a daughter that was older than I was, and she passed away from cancer. And then they had a daughter that was my age. And uh, her husband shot and killed her. And you know, when I think of the husband and the wife, my friends, they, you, you can't connect that with that. It's just what happened. But it's nothing that they do, nothing to do. Okay? Crossing over into the New Testament, we see the young rich ruler in Mark chapter 10, verse 20 through 22. Number one, Jesus loved him. Number two, he walked away sad. Number three, Jesus never called him back. Now you can go. Sell all you have and give it to the poor. Now you're not saying that like you need to go sell your house, your cars, and you know. The issue with the young rich ruler, I mean, he's young in one gospel, he's rich in another gospel, he's a ruler in another gospel. You have to put them together to figure it out. He's a young rich ruler. But he's really loving his money. And that's his God. And so Jesus told him to sell all you have to the poor. He couldn't do it. Jesus didn't like, you know, pull a bull and say, hey, Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my head. You know, it, he didn't do any miracles. He didn't say, hey, I'm the son of God, watch this. He didn't do it. He let him go. He honored his choice. That's called free will. Jesus refused to speak with Herod. All four Herods were some of the most corrupt people that ever walked the face of the earth. Anybody that orders your military to go through Bethlehem and slaughter babies under two years of age, there's something wrong with you besides being demon-possessed. And Jesus never talked to you. There is no record of Jesus talking to any one of the four Herods. And when Jesus went to trial, Pilate sent him to Herod, and Herod kept saying, I need a miracle. Show me a miracle. Do it again. Come on, give the king of the Jews. Jesus never said boo. Not one word to Herod. Why? He was long gone already. Ananias and Sapphira. Now, this is an interesting one to me, and I wanted to include them as far as biblical examples. In Acts chapter 5, the, the, there was a communal living that was uh, instituted in the early church in the body of Christ. It really didn't work, right? It was like communism that didn't work. Because it never does. And so when you see Ananias and Sapphira observing Barnabas, Barnabas sold a, a piece of property and he took all the money from the sale and he laid it at the apostles' feet. And therefore people saw this. People in the early church witnessed it, right? And then that, that, it's not that they're going to abuse that money. It's going to be used in a good way. And so, but Ananias and Sapphira were a married couple. But they saw that. And something triggered in their minds. And they thought, well, you know, we got this lot back here. Let's sell it. And we can keep some of the money. And we'll just tell everybody it's the full price. And so they kept back some of the money. And they, they, they gave the rest of the money. And they laid it at the feet of Peter. Look, John, who wrote First John, is right there watching this. He's one of the A apostles. He's not a B, C apostle. He's A. He's there. And so he's right there checking this whole thing out with his eyes. He was a witness to the whole thing. So Ananias shows up, and Peter says, was that the full price for the land? And Peter lies, and he says, yeah. And Pete says, you didn't lie to men. You just and lied to the Holy and Spirit. Is that amazing? You just lied to God. And so he dropped dead right there, breathed his last, and they got some of these uh, XYZ fossils to go bury him. So they put him in the Anyway, they dragged him out and buried the guy. And then 
I don't know, a couple hours later, he, his wife shows up. Same question, same lie. And he says, the feet of them um, who bury your husband are here to bury you. And she drops right down. And personally, it's my own personal opinion. I won't be surprised if I meet Ananias and Sapphira in heaven. And the reason I say that is because there's no blasphemy of the Holy Spirit here. They lie. There's no record of them being like perennial liars. It's not, you know, it's like, hey, here comes the liars, you know, and I see the pirate. Liar, that's your middle name right now. That's it. So I, I, for me, I believe it's possible that we can see them. And yet God is the one who did it. It didn't just happen. I heard a guy on the radio one time, it just crossed me, my memory. Um, somebody, it was a call and talk show, and somebody called up and they said, well, if, if God is so gracious and gracey, 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 and all you talk about is grace because there's grace and grace and not that grace over there. Over there. So, she's, 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 so anyway, so anyway, there's this um, guy and he answered the question like, you're talking about grace so much, then, then, then what about what happened with Ananias and Sapphira? And, and the guy who's the host of the show said, they died of course in our heart attack. Like, really? I mean, I, you, you gotta be kidding me that somebody would answer. From the Pacific to the Atlantic, people heard that. You gotta be kidding me. And the guy said, I went straight face because I couldn't hear the laughing. All right. And then finally, in, in biblical speaking now, how many in the area of Corinth Drop dead during the Lord's table. That's what it says. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 30, there were people in Corinth who totally were okay with sinning because they just somehow didn't have the full gospel. And they, they were misusing, abusing the Lord's table. Some people were even coming and getting drunk at the Lord's table. And they were not examining themselves, right? Rightly, we should examine ourselves. Every Tuesday, we have the Lord's table. We get it in here, uh, periodical so Every Tuesday, we have the Lord's table. Chad leads us into that part of our gathering. And uh, so anyway, that paints the picture. They were abusing and misusing the Lord's table. And the Bible says that many of you in Corinth sleep. Sleep is a euphemism for die. You die. You die. Because you, you don't respect, you are irreverent before the Lord Jesus Christ. So can you imagine the grace that God is giving us today? To... When I do that, it just means the Holy Spirit told me, don't say that. Okay. Now, we'll get into real life, personal. Really happened. There was a cop that used to go here named Dave Snodgrass. Right? Dave and Karen lived in Spring Valley. They had a little daughter named Katie. She played with my daughter, Lisa, and uh, actually Thomas. They all three hung out together. And um, Dave had a friend that was a pastor in Alabama. And there was a Thanksgiving where him and his wife and two boys uh, came to Arizona. They're going to move to Arizona. And so they had Thanksgiving at my house. Uh, which is over the Spring Valley, not now, but it's still there. We had Thanksgiving together over there, and we talked about the Lord, and you know, he was saying some of his experience pastoring the church in Alabama, etc., all that. So it turns out that they decide they want to live in the East Valley. I don't know why, but they, they go out there. And then the next thing you know, that this guy that was a pastor is in the not, they're not fellowshipping anywhere with Christians. They can't find what you would call a church where they fit in. I'm like, what? You know, John Higgins, Doug Warley, Jim Remington, uh, Charlie Johnson. How many of you want me to name? These are all good Bible teaching chat uh, pastors that I know in the East Valley. Why aren't you in one of these congregations? And the guy's like, well, you know, I try it. It's just not who we are. Blah, 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 blah. And so... This guy decides it would be a good idea to get into skydiving. And he goes skydiving, right? He's all into it. And there's no church in these people. So what, what do you see here? A pastor who has now decided that a good idea would be to leave his wife 
and his two kids away from the things that God has. It's the precepts of God that you do not as, uh, forsake the assembly, which is the manner of some. But we're to gather together, not just to listen to me, but to love on one another and encourage one another to love and good deeds. So this guy takes his family out there and they want to just watch his dad go have fun flying around through the sky pretending he's Superman. And so they fly up there and get up somewhere above Eloy. This guy jumps out of the plane and you shoot them. What was he thinking about my God? And if you were to close your eyes and just try to imagine you have just jumped out of an airplane, there's nothing to hold on to. Gravity is going to, it's happening. And you are going to leave the ground and you're going to be no more on this earth. He jumped out of that airplane at 9 o'clock on a Sunday morning. Where are you supposed to be at 9 o'clock on a Sunday morning? Sure. Sure. That's a skinny in the pit of your stomach, man. You think, oh, this guy, you know. I mean, repentance is one thing where God is a God who knows this guy's going to keep going down the same trail. So he's out, and his wife moves back to Alabama, marries somebody who now begins to be daddy to these two young boys. Walk with Jesus. Just walk with Jesus. This, these things happen. I'm sure that there are people that could pick this up on YouTube and say, wow, well, how good is the false prophet? You know, I serve a God of love. Well, that is love. God was loving this guy's wife and two kids. It was his decision to lead them astray. God causes addition in a church by subtraction from time to time. And I can testify, and there are people in this congregation that can testify that when we have seen addition by subtraction, the church became stronger. Amen. And we have seen God do things that we didn't, we didn't even plan. And we are, you know, that Christmas season got in the way, but we are about to start church number six since COVID. Yeah. Since COVID. We, we got the pastor, we have a building congregation, we have a location by an international airport, the land is secure, and, and the building is about to go up. Yeah. I'm you, you know, Enough said. In the context of the context, there's a man who's a good Bible teacher, he's a Baptist fellow out of Dallas somewhere, I think. His name is Bob Utley, and uh, when I would go to um, South Sudan uh, to teach the soldiers in the South Sudan army, I would always copy uh, Bob Utley's notes off the internet for the books that I had that I was assigned to teach. And he made this comment about this text. You can only commit the unpardonable sin and the sin unto death in the presence of great light. You understand that? You can't commit these two sins worthy of death and worthy of, worthy of damnation in, as far as the unpardonable sin is concerned, except that you have been in the presence of great light. Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. you got to come to Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. You have to have been aware completely of Jesus Christ, and then you've got other things that you want to put in place. You have other priorities. That kind of a person has ignored Christ. They don't, they don't want anything to do with it. And I just want to say that if you're worried that you have ever committed the unpardonable sin, then that's a good sign. You're in good territory. You still have a chance. Come to Christ. Because if, if you didn't care, then that would mean that maybe you did. If you committed the unpardonable sin, you're tracking me, you wouldn't care. But if you're concerned and you know that you need to strengthen up your walk in Jesus, then that's a good sign. Pastor Chuck Smith one time said, God will not save anyone against their will. He won't. He, I know some people believe he will. I don't know why they think that. He will put pressure on you to get your attention. He will. He will not compel you to go against your will 
but he sure can make you willing to go. He knows how. Well, God made the, the Canaanites willing to get out just by sending hornets in front of the Israeli army once they crossed the river. That was a way of getting them out. Uh, God had a way of compelling Jonah. Remember from the start to the finish, Jonah was nothing but fighting God like a I think those Mennonites need to go to hell like 10 times and forever. And look at what they do to Jews. Oh, I'm not going over there and telling them about Yahweh. Forget it. So he hops a boat, goes in the other direction. Big storm comes up. And finally they figure it out. We've got to throw this guy overboard. Big giant fish. It sets fish. I, you know, whale fish. It was a big thing that came out of the water. And it ate him. And so, so if you can imagine, Jonah's down there. You realize how stubborn this guy was? Three days. And after three days, Jonah prayed. He was three days in the slimy, dark, smelly guts of this fish until, and all the way, God knew what was going to happen. God did the whole, he orchestrated the whole event. You get, you get that fish coming toward Tel Aviv. Bring them back toward Joppa. You know, here, here, forget all that Crete, Italy thing. We're going this way. And so, you know, here comes the fish, and Jonah's just sitting there, three day journey inside this. And then he barfs him on the beach. And there he is. He has no hair. He looks paper white from the vitamin A content in his uh, creatures. And then he goes walking in Nineveh. Everybody wanted to believe in God when this thing came walking into the middle of <laughs> You see that guy? Just do whatever he says. And things are Martian. He's a zealous all. So God sent hornets. God had the fish with Jonah. God, God took me to the woodshed for a year and a half. That's, my, that's all part of my story. I knew I wanted Jesus. I knew it. I don't remember the message. I ran to the 50-yard line, just hardly knew what I was doing. But I knew I wanted Jesus. And then I continued to insist on my way of living, what was convenient in my opinion, uh, because I had Christ, and, you know, okay. And then God, one by one, said, here's your friends, you don't have any, here's your money, you're out, here's your car, yeah, give me your car. Your car's going to die in Galloway, Texas. By the way, nobody will speak English there, it's just you. And, <laughs> And this is really what happened. And everything was gone. There's like zero. There's nothing but Jesus Christ. And that's what God wanted. He took everything away from me so that all I would have was Jesus. And then he put my life back together from that day. And it's, it's, I've never gone backwards. Sure, there's ups and downs and downs and ups, but God can handle them all. And you have to choose. I had to pray. I had to feel that conviction so hard that I paid attention. There, we, we end with this. Um, there is simply no further info to offer to some people that you have witnessed to, and you witness, and you witness, and you witness, and you just don't want to get in a discussion anymore with some of these people. I'll tell you what, we had a guy living in Black Canyon City, and he used to work at that Napa store went over there and down by the, the gas station was a gas station. This guy was big into the whole Jehovah's Witness non-biblical cult. And he would have discussions with me for one reason and one reason only. To irritate me to no end. Because I believe he knew that I was not going to convert and he was staunchly never going to convert to Christianity. He was going to stay a member of that. And there, so what he would do is he would find me around town and he would stop his truck and he would start the conversation until one day when I finally got forget you Harvey you, you know, I don't have any time for you you know if, if you need if you need to know you know I got to see something before I ever pay attention to you and I don't see any humility in you so good luck and one day I was installing we had a sign here right on the corner and here comes Harvey and he rolls out his window, stops his truck, and he starts asking me a biblical question. And I'm saying, Harvey, move on. I don't have time for you anymore. We're done. Okay? Save it. Okay, you're going to ask me the question. I'm going to give you the biblical answer, and you're going to tell me how I'm wrong. I got that? Is that, is that? Okay. Have a nice day. And you might think that's cruel. That's a, the reverie of these I'm done with Harvey. Harvey can go to one of you. 
I'm not the only person in this town. If we're truly a follower of Jesus Christ, then we do begin to follow his precepts. We begin to do the things that Jesus wants us to do. We want to live like Jesus wants us to live. And according to the word of God, Harvey's about the only guy I can think of where I would just say, save your dumb heart. Don't get in this battle. Don't, because you're just wasting your power. You're wasting your words. We're meant to be the participators participants in the kingdom of God and what he's doing, gathering, not scattering. And I would uh, close by encouraging us as a congregation with two serious concerns which are backed up in scripture. And one of them is in 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. And so in verse 20, the word of God says, if someone says, here's number one, there's two of them, here's one. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, I understand there are people that they look like brothers or they look like sisters, and you know, I'd have to say, whew, it's a big question. But if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment, it's not a suggestion, we have from him that the one who loves God should love his brother also. So, you can always pray for repentance. How bad would that be? If they're in your face, if they do things to irritate you, I don't have a problem asking God to scatter them. Um, just get them away from me. Um, but I think that if you pray according to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16 through 18, you're on real safe ground. Because if someone then gets a spirit of wisdom, a spirit of revelation, and have the eyes of their heart open up, you're going to be trapped together. So those are good prayers to pray for people that, you know, you can't stand. No, they're not your own. But Corey Ken Boom said, to forgive is to set a person free, a prisoner free, and then to realize that the prisoner is you. So then finally, number two is if you have any, if you have not ever entrusted your life to Jesus Christ, well, you're not born again. That's just plain and simple. And, you know, I believe the pastor that jumped out of the airplane will be in heaven. You know, he was just getting in the way of God's plan. So what we've seen today, this morning, is something very difficult for a lot of people that will say they're Christians to believe. And I would go so far as to say there's pastors that would disagree with what you've just heard, but that's their problem. We never want to live a life that will get cut short. Hey, look at there's people out there that had their life cut short because they committed adultery or fornicated and got AIDS. Life cut short. It's not so unusual. So let's walk with God and when it's time to go, we'll go. Hopefully be raptured. But let's not get in God's way because he's got a plan for us. It's, it's going to be exciting. This year's going to be filled with exciting things. Just like last year. It was a year where you know, we really saw something, especially around here. Let alone two more church dedications and one in Nicaragua and Honduras, but here too. I mean, we've got remodeling things going on, ministries happening, and uh, we have a couple of ministries that we're, we're praying about right now. I think this this kind of needs grief share. I know we can't do everything, but this community is just right for grief share. All that. Okay. Let's stand before. You. Thank you for guiding us through these two verses. Thank you for your promises that when we know that we are the children of God because of our faith in the Son of God, Yeshua Hamashiach, Jesus in his life, 
I pray that if anybody has serious questions or concerns after today's message, that they'll take the time to come over and ask me about it so we can make sure that everybody has a clear vision of your message to us. And this morning, we also want to thank you for showing us the seriousness of our own walk with you. That we're to truly be reverent towards you. And to realize that the world is filled with people and organizations and governments that want to turn us away from following the Bible. That there are people, and some of them in high places, that want to make fun of us and belittle us and be mocking Jesus Christ. And it'll be to their own demise. I confess to you, Lord. You know, I, I don't even know, could Harvey, whoever he lives today, come to Christ? It's possible. I, I confess I'm not qualified to say this person, that person. I just know I'm not ready to talk with Harvey about anything. So, Lord, I just want to close out by asking you to fill these people with a sense of your Holy Spirit. With your Holy Spirit. Not just a sense, but the Spirit of the living God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Grant the peace of God that passes all understanding to everyone here. Because every person who has professed Jesus Christ to be their Lord, their owner, their Savior, the one who rescues, every person to be filled with that calm confidence, the peace that passes all understanding. For those in our congregation that are facing great difficulties, and, you know, times of distress, and blindsided things, I never saw that coming. I just pray for all that you will shield them, for thou, O Lord, are a shield. You are our glory and the lifter of our heads. Thank you. So may that peace of God abound in our hearts. And may this be a week, Lord, of great increase when we meet people to invite people to Jesus Christ, that the boldness the Holy Spirit brings will be on us. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.